delighted on this episode to be talking with author and creator Michael Jan Friedman. Mike, Michael, Mike or Michael? Uh, you can call me Mike. Okay, Mike, thank you for jumping in. Thank you for joining and talking with me for a few minutes about the world of science fiction and prose and comics and uh, all of the amazing things that you've created over the years and continuing to create. Yeah, that's right. I'm still still, still kicking. Yeah, yeah, love it. Um, I'll mention a few kind of domains that you've worked in here, and then we can circle back to anything that uh, you'd like to as far as talking about the work. And so Star Trek being, of course, one of those first big areas that you've worked in, as well as writing for DC um, with, let me make sure I get this title right, Legends of the DC Universe uh, and Justice League being part of your work as well. Yeah, the, the the two main things I did for DC were the um, Star Trek Next Generation comic, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which ran for like seven years, and then uh, and and an original uh, superhero comic called Dark Stars. Yeah, yeah, very cool, very cool. And um, you've also worked across media and film and television, so I'm sure we'll we'll talk a little bit about those things as well. Um, Curious about what drew you to this world of creating in comics and science fiction initially. Well, you know, uh, uh, in in uh, I'll, I'll give you a very literary answer. The, okay, you know, sounds great. Great Gatsby, right? There's uh, there's <laughs> a line. Uh, they, they're talking about the, um, the 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 first Dutch sailor that saw the coast of Long Island, and and it was described as an object commensurate with his capacity for wonder, mm -hmm. and. That's what science fiction and, and, and superhero comics and fantasy, that's what that was for me. It was an, they, they were objects commensurate with my capacity for wonder, and, and that's what stimulated me. It, it, you know, the characters were great and the plots were great. That was all, you know, I love that. But the fact that it touched on places and themes that and times that that i i could barely imagine that mm -hmm. was was really in it you know what what uh what drew me to it yeah very cool very cool and i just finished teaching the great gatsby about a month ago yeah. so uh yeah w wonderful symmetry there um now at what point did you know that writing was the path for you that that was what you wanted to do i think it was like last tuesday yeah yeah nice <laughs> I said, it's gonna be it for me <laughs> uh, it, on, honestly, it, it, you know, there are, there are two components to that. One is, did I want to do it? Yeah, probably from the age of about six. Mm -hmm. I, I said, I love these stories, these, uh, whether it's prose or comics, I, I love these stories. I'm uh, inclined, impelled to do my own stories. Mm -hmm. uh, but but in terms of whether I thought I would ever actually get to do that professionally, no way. Mm. No, I, I, I did it and I kept on doing it. And I guess in the back of my head, there was some, you know, I was harboring some hope that, that maybe I would, you know, do this for a living one day. But it really wasn't until probably when I was in college and, and Isaac Asimov came to speak that I, that it was confirmed for me that someone did this full time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I saw names on on the covers of books, and I and I knew that someone wrote them, but I didn't know anyone who did that. I didn't know anyone who knew anyone who did that. I didn't know anyone who had ever bumped into anyone who did that. So it was like a different world for me, um, and and I didn't really see myself in it. Um, and and uh, eventually, eventually, I, I um, in college, uh, I ran into a guy whose family had a literary agency, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and and uh, I was writing a humor column at the time, and it was well received. And and he said, Mike, when you write your 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 first novel, you come to me because by then I'll be working at the agency. So I did. I, I wrote I wrote a novel and uh, a fantasy novel and I brought it to him and first of all he was shocked he said wow you really did it I said I don't know. you seemed you seemed confident at the time but uh, anyway so I so I gave it to him and he read it like in no time 
And he said, Mike, this could be one of the next great science fiction classics. He goes, or, you know, it could be a pile of horse manure. I, I really don't know. <laughs> I don't read this stuff, so I'm not a good audience. Uh, let me let me put you in touch with somebody who I know handles science fiction and fantasy. Uh -huh. So he put me in touch with another agency. And uh, and I I called them and I said, you know, I'm a, I'm a you know, fledgling writer and I have this manuscript. And they said, um, well, you know, we're not looking for any new writers right now. And in my bravado, you know, I had to be, I knew I, I had to be a little pushy. Uh -huh. I said, uh, don't you want the next Stephen King? And they said, well, actually, we're very happy with the current Stephen King. <laughs> <laughs> I said, oh, great, Stephen King's agent. That's where they sent me. But anyway, I, I, I said, so let me, so where else can I go? Where else can I go with this? And they sent me to an agency that did, in fact, represent new authors and specialized in science fiction and fantasy and um, read it. One of their agents read it and liked it and, and made some suggestions as far as adding a couple of chapters and, um, uh, I did what, what they recommended, and days later, I got a call, and they said, Mike, we, we sold your book. And, I, and, and it took a while for the words to, to sink in, and, and, and it, I was just numb. I was just numb, elated, obviously, but just, uh -huh. just numb. Like, like it was so life-changing, because I, I had always said, if I could just write one published novel, I can die happy. Uh -huh. And, and, and there it was. And there it was. And at that point I was saying, okay, maybe two. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. <laughs> but and, uh, uh, the goals but, continue. <laughs> right, right. So, so I, I, you know, I, I wanted it to be the path for me early, mm -hmm. very early. On. But in terms of when I, reason could reasonably expect that it might be probably um that was probably almost um probably almost 30. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah well and, and since that time you've um taken off in quite a few directions mm -hmm. as well from prose to comics uh i believe you wrote was it an episode of voyager is that right yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It's actually co-wrote because you know it's a collaborative process. But yeah, an episode of Voyager, Cold yeah. Resistance. Yeah, um, and you've also worked on. I was going to ask you about your film adaptations uh, into novelized form because those those were big for me as a reader, and I don't see them as much now. I don't see them as often, but I used to read the book before I saw the movie and then I would see the movie and go back and read the book again. Um, so curious about what that process was like. Well, the, first of all, the reason you don't see them is an economic one. You know, they, um, they, uh, people don't read as much as they did before. And it was never a big part of the, of the, uh, package. Mm -hmm. the, the, even though we think of, Oh my God, you know, that novelization, you know, must've sold like crazy. But in the context of of the movie and and uh, the licensed offshoots of the movie, it really wasn't a big ever a big part. Mm -hmm. and, and now the amount of effort that they have to put into it, these the 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 amount of money they get out of it, they 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 just don't do it that much anymore. But the the process is a very it is a wonderful one. Mm -hmm. On the downside, you have to work quickly because they give you a, a, the, the most advanced version of the script that they can afford to give you. And uh, you might have as few as two weeks or maybe a month if you're lucky to, to do the novelization. But um, uh, in terms of the process, just, just turning the prose, just turning the um, dialogue and the... Um, directions into prose that's like half a book right there yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. So now, now it's a question of what am I gonna, what am I gonna add to that? What, what enrichment can I add to that? Um, when I did the um, the adaptation for the Batman and Robin movie, mm-hmm. George Clooney, uh, mm-hmm. uh, Batman, um, I added in, I added in a lot of material at the beginning, setting up the the relationship with with Mister Freeze and um, how that came about and um uh i retold which is everybody's every every comic book writer's dream i retold the story of of how batman's parents were killed Mm -hmm. Uh, you know that was that's every every writer should have a chance to do that and um uh and i put in you know i found i found opportunities to put in um uh narrative in the interstices in the gaps in the in the movie because a movie can't cover that much really mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. uh, when you when you when you turn the um as i said when you turn the the script into narrative it's that's only like 120 pages yeah so there's yeah. a lot that you can that you can fill in and um some some uh scripts are very tight and and economical and um uh like uh the, the two part uh series finale for for um Star Trek the Next Generation mm-hmm. all the things that was very hard to put in ancillary material uh in in that in that script because it was so tight you know everything was happening and it was and it was happening across three different time periods so it was confusing to begin with and i didn't want to confuse the reader even more mm-hmm. that was kind of difficult the batman one was easy it was easy to come up with great great stuff to fill in those gaps um you know the the other the other element of of the adaptation is the approval process mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You you're working with a, a publisher who has the license from the, a movie studio, um, and I and I worked with you know Paramount and Pocket Books enough to know how that worked. But every every licensor is different, and uh, Warner was uh, um, was pretty good, pretty good. They let me do a lot of things. You know, I turned. You know, it's a campy movie. And so I, that wasn't really my Batman. And and I wanted to turn it into something more like um, the Batman in DC comics as as envisioned by Denny O'Neill yeah. and, uh, and turn him into a, a an urban legend. Not the guy who's going to stand there at the flower ball, you know, going, oh, hi, you know, glad handing. Right, so, right. So I uh, so I turned him into, you know, I, I found ways to turn him back into that urban legend. I had him and 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 Robin attending the ball as janitors, so nobody knew who were, who they were, and and but and Warner was fine with all with all those that you know that sort of change. The mm-hmm. only thing they gave me a hard time with was I I called Batman the Batman because he was originally known as the Batman. Mm-hmm. In fact, in fact, the most recent Batman movie is called the Batman. He's mm-hmm. called the Batman. And and I thought that would be a nice touch, but they didn't like the definite article, huh. so <laughs> so they made me take it out, which I think I think reduced the book the manuscript by like a page and a half. <laughs> Inter- interesting uh, point to get tangled on for them. That that is interesting. Yeah. yeah. Uh, now you've also you've created in the world of the X-Men uh, again, Star Trek it both in novelizations in the, in the comics format. Um, what's it like to write between the comics format and like a prose novel kind of space? Well, um, comics um, are, are nice in that they're collaborative, mm-hmm. you know, working with, with um, an artist, who's probably got a better imagination than you do. And, you know, you give them some direction, but almost invariably what they come up with, what they produce is better than what you had in mind. So mm-hmm. that's, that's a nice thing. And uh, you don't have to do 
uh, any any scene setting. It's all there visually. I mean, you have to tell the artist what to draw, but that takes no time as opposed to, you know, a page of exposition about uh, about the setting. Um, and um, you're you're um, you're putting in dialogue. You don't have to worry about attributions and and uh, describing the characters and how they look and what their expressions were. You know, a few words to the artist, and that's all there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so the, you're doing less work in a way, um, but you have to kind of be able to know how to tell the story because you only have, let's say, you have six panels a page and 24 pages, you know, so that's uh, like 150 beats. You can't, you, you know, and you may want to expand some of them, some of those moments. So, so you're, you're really restricted to telling the story in beats uh -huh, uh -huh. And, um, and the reader has to fill in the gaps in, with his or her imagination. Um, so that's, that's writing for comics, writing prose, everything's on you, man, everything's yeah. on you. <laughs> Got everything that you want the reader to know you have to supply. Yeah. And, um, uh, but it's, you know, I like it. It's, you know, I like, I like having control. Mm -hmm. In fact, when you write a comic, there are two different ways to do it. And um, um, one is uh, full script where it's very much like a movie script. You know, mm -hmm. here's, here's what's happening in this panel. Here's, um, um, uh, here's the dialogue. Here's a caption. If you have captions, you know, everything, you, you say exactly what's going on, and then the artist responds to that. Um, the Marvel the Marvel method, is, as it's often called, is different. It gives the, the artist a lot more control because it is, after all, a visual medium, and uh, a lot of people are buying the comic for the artist. Um, yeah, yeah. So so the uh, what you do is you write uh, a plot for the, for the um, page, and you say what's on the page, what happens, and then the artist renders that, the pencil artist renders that, you get the page back, and then you put in the dialogue. So the art, you, you can only dialogue it to the extent that the artist lets you, and in mm -hmm. way that the artist has, has accommodated. So that gives the artist a lot more, a lot more control. So I, I like having control. I like that full script. And when you write prose, of course, you have all the control. Uh -huh. so, so I enjoy that. And there are things, there are things you can, you can do in prose that, that you can't do in comics or do as well in comics. There are um, surprises. There's certain pacing that you can, you can, uh, you can accomplish better. In, in prose than in, in comics. Yeah, yeah. Um, just imagining that blank landscape of the page for uh, the world of prose and then supplying everything. Yeah, yeah. yeah, um, yeah. So, as I've mentioned, you, you have several works that have accumulated over the years. Any, any particular mile markers before we get to the final question? Um, and again, you mentioned Dark Stars being one of those, uh, your original series with DC. So curious about what that was like and any other um, sort of major milestones that you would want to hit. Well, um, I wrote, uh, you know, uh, there was a Star Trek Next Generation comic at DC. It was 80 <clears throat> ran 80 issues i wrote 77 of them so so that was it was basically my my title i loved that and uh, and i was able to do a lot of um a lot of stories that i would have written for the for the series if they had let me mm -hmm. so so that was that was interesting and it was done it was done concurrently with the with the show you know there are um uh, comic adaptations of shows that have since you know uh, since ended, but in this case we were running concurrently, and um, so I would give out I would I would give Paramount like six six plots at a time, uh -huh. six plots, 
and they would so they would usually say, "Oh, these three are great. This one you have to make some changes. We can't tell you why, uh, be, but it, you know, and this one you can't do because it's in conflict with one that's coming up in three weeks, and <laughs> this one you can't do because it is the one that we're coming up with in three weeks." So, so you, uh, you know, you were, it, it was, it was almost like being in the writer's room. Mm, uh-huh. uh, so that was that. And, and then, um, and I did a lot of annuals and so on, Star Trek annuals and so on as well. And then Dark Stars was, um, what happened was, um, I went into DC one day on my birthday, cause I couldn't think of anything much better than going into DC on my birthday. And, uh, and I pitched, um, some inventory stories um to the justice league editor who was too busy to really listen and said listen mike i i I just can't give you the attention i'd like to give you uh you want to do a green lantern story you want to do a martian manhunter story i get it let's talk about it down the road and so i was a little discouraged and um uh, two of the other editors good friends uh uh uh, bob greenberger and brian augustine Uh uh, uh, took me to lunch uh, as as we were scheduled to do. We went to Mickey Mantle's restaurant because I was a huge Mickey Mantle fan when I was a kid. And um, uh, and Mantle was actually there that day, which was even more special. Nice. And, um, and so we uh, so we were talking and, and they said, well, OK, so you like these characters, Green Lantern, Martian Manhunter. What would you do with them if you had them? And I told them. And and we said, well, wait a second. What if we, what if we combined them? What would that character be like? And hmm. that, and that's the character that became Dark Star. And he was he was sort of a, an alternative to the Green Lanterns, way back before there were different colors of Green Lanterns. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, um, the they were, whereas the Green Lanterns um, were. Uh, the product of the guardians of the galaxy um they uh where they were assigned to keep uh keep things in in order um well in order th- keep uh keep crime inter- intergalactic crime uh, mm-hmm. and, and other problems at a minimum um in their in their own sectors um the dark stars were a similar organization except they were run by the controllers mm-hmm. who had who had the same roots ultimately as as the guardians and um uh the controllers were all, all about order keeping order and they thought it was a crazy idea to take like an earth man to to be the 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 lawman on earth it's like no no there are much races that are much better suited for that Mm-hmm. So Dark Star, uh, this guy Ferran Colos, uh, was um, was assigned to Earth, which was not a good assignment. <laughs> you know, he yeah. was not happy with it, and uh, and he was much more dirty and hands on and and uh, down and dirty, hands on and uh, and expedient than, for instance, Hal Jordan, you know, the Green Lantern. Mm-hmm. And so that was Dark Stars, and and Dark Stars ran for a little over three years um, in the DC universe. It's since become some kind of uh, uh, villainous entity, uh-huh. the organization. But you know that's you know DC can pretty much they you know they can do that. The nature of our of our contract was that they could pretty much do whatever they wanted with, um, but. Uh, but for a while, for for three and a half years, you know, I had a a character in the DC universe, uh, mm-hmm. and that be cool. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and three years in the world of comics, especially nowadays, that is a, a really substantial run. Yeah, it was pre- it was pretty good. You know, it's funny. I I look at things like, um, you know, uh, titles and features that that I really loved when I was, when I was young. And, and I look at how long they ran and uh-huh. some of them, like there was a, there was something called the atomic nights that, that ran, um, 
in the back of, I guess, one of the mystery in space, maybe one of the strange adventures, strange adventures, one of the, one of the science fiction titles. And, uh, and it was so cool. And I, and they, they didn't run three, three years plus. And yeah. I was thinking, so, so my feature ran even longer than this, this, this feature that I, that I remember fondly. So, so yeah, it's cool. It'll always be a part of, of the DC universe. And, and that's a, that's, that's very gratifying. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so these days, what are you up to creatively? What are the the next creative steps? Well, um, I'm currently working on two projects. Um, uh, well, I'm always working on two projects. Uh, one is, is a series called Phenomenons and it's a, um, it's a prose, uh, anthology series, uh, uh, about superheroes in an, in a slightly alternate universe, a um, a universe where the we we never came out of the financial crisis of the nineteen eighties, mm-hmm. and uh, as a result, it's not that we went into a depression, but as a result, um, these what we call the captains of industry were able to uh, uh, build themselves up and into sort of like a a, a class of mini Lex Luthers. Mm-hmm. And uh, and so they're very much in charge of things, and uh, and they create a lot of the situations that our heroes have to deal with. And uh, that was volume one. In volume two, things get get a little more complicated, a little more interesting. And now we're up to volume three, which we're kickstarting uh, through December second. Um, and uh, in volume three, it gets even more interesting. Um, so that's uh, that's that's the um, anthology series, and that's uh, done with um, fifteen other writers who who you know I love working with, mm-hmm. and I, because I because I I knew I would love working with them. Some of whom I worked with before, some of whom I, you know I just admired their work, and these are writers who who were Nebula and Hugo Award nominees perennial nominees and they write for tv and they write movies and and uh and 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 it's funny even the ones who who work in in other media um that you would think would be more prestigious they're the ones who are first in when i say okay who's into this next volume oh me 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 right so, oh nice nice yeah, yeah it's great and and they're great people because why not mm-hmm. um, uh, as long as we're picking people, why why not pick great people? Yeah, uh, and uh, and so that's one project, uh, and and this latest volume it's called Phenomenons: The Wind and Fire. Um, and um, then I also do a series of of solo projects. The latest one is uh, is uh, will be released in the next couple of weeks, like by probably by Thanksgiving. Um, and, uh, uh, that's, uh, this one, it's a series of short stories. I've been publishing short story collections lately, and mm-hmm. I don't, I don't know <laughs> how I went from writing only novels to writing almost only short stories, but, but there you go. Yeah. Um, this is, this is called Thelos and Other Stories, and, um, and it's all original um, science fiction, fantasy, and superhero stories. Wonderful, and, wonderful. And and the idea, you know, as in as in phenomenon series, the idea of doing superheroes and prose is something that's always appealed to me. Mm-hmm. And it maybe it's a little counterintuitive, but but there's something there. You can really get into the character, mm-hmm. and um, uh, in a, in a way that you can't in the comics. And uh, and so that that's always held an appeal for me. And now I can now I can scratch that itch. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Well, I appreciate the the continued work that you're doing, and I'll make sure that the Kickstarter link is down here or up here somewhere around our image, as well as in the podcast description. Good. I'll I'll send it to you so that so that you have it. 
Wonderful, wonderful. Um, did we miss anything in the talk through that you want to make sure to share before we close out? Um, I guess I guess we could talk for a minute about Crazy Eight Press. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, probably about twelve years ago, um, I saw that the the um, marketplace was changing. Uh, Borders was going out of business. That was huge, and mm -hmm. I wanted to preserve the relationship between the reader and the writer. Those are the essential components. Everything else is just, you know, uh, 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 to facilitate that. And and um, and so I said, you know, we should have a, a group of writers that publishes directly to the consumer, directly mm -hmm. to the reader. And um, and uh, we came up with this, this, it was called Crazy Eight Press, because originally in the very beginning, we had eight, eight members and um, uh, we we took advantage of the fact uh, that there were some positive changes in the marketplace, like the means of distribution was no longer um, uh, restricted to the traditional publishers. Uh -huh. uh, uh, the means of production was no longer restricted to those uh, to those publishers. The only thing that really the traditional publishers could offer was an advance. And, and a little marketing and the marketing was so meager as as to be almost non-existent so we you know we we said we can do this we can we can do this with um much better margins if we do it directly and um and we don't have to sell as many books if we have much better margins mm -hmm. so uh, so it's worked out we have um there are currently 10 of us in crazy eight and we publish the things that we really want to publish, the things that. that we would want to read. And and as a result, you get a certain energy and a certain uh, level of authenticity mm -hmm. that that you would be hard pressed to find, you know, in, in other books. Um, and we currently have uh, over 70 books in inventory at, at our website, crazyapress.com. So, uh, so that's been, oh, and here, right? there you go. I saw that. Yeah. There's yeah. the logo. Yeah. There. Um, so, so we've, uh, we've, you know, achieved a measure of success with that. And, uh, and it's just great working with other writers, you know, either in the anthology format or within our, our organization of crazy eight. Mm -hmm. Um, it, it's great because writing is a, is traditionally a very lonely profession and so if you can if you can work with other people um that's that that makes it a lot easier a lot more fun yeah yeah absolutely i, I will link the website as well for crazy a cool. um and, and mike i appreciate your time i appreciate getting the chance to meet you and, and talk about comics and creating and science fiction for a little while yeah yeah, it's 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 been a lot of fun. I appreciate uh, appreciate your having me. Yeah, my pleasure, and, and glad to have you back anytime. Okay, great. I'll right. I'll take up on that. All right. Thanks so much. Okay. Take care. You too.